All right, let's get underway. I have a couple of things to take care of, sort of uh, housekeeping here. You recall that every Janu- uh, February, sorry, February, uh, we try to help out Cooks and Hills uh, Center. Uh, you, if you are new with us, you may not know this, but Mary Whitaker is a missionary of the Board of Global Ministries out of New York who's been assigned to the Cooks and Hills area of Oklahoma for 25 years. Uh, Mary is a very unusual person of amazing ability. She is uh, dealing with some of the poorest, economically poorest people in Oklahoma. And we Methodists have a great center there. Uh, some years ago, back when Ken Ingram was here, good, it's been 25 years ago, uh, Mary was asked shortly after she came, Mary, what's the biggest need you have? And she said, you know, if I say I need more softballs, some Sunday school class will send me a dozen. If we need two new bats and four new gloves, we can get that. What I have trouble with is paying the light bill, particularly at the beginning of the year uh, when a lot of churches are still finishing up their year before and they've paid all their bills and they're sort of struggling to get started. They don't always pay their apportionment to us right away. So January and February, she said, pay on the light bill. That's the big problem. So Ken Ingram and she came up with the idea of call Lights On for Cookson. Lights On for Cookson. And uh, it's not a high-pressure campaign of any sort. All the Sunday school classes, they are just being asked if they want to uh, help Mary keep the lights on. She said that last year, our contribution from Boston Avenue, and this is above what, what other churches do. We do that as well. We do our first mile giving through the apportionment system, and this is a special gift uh, that last year our gift to her uh, covered her utility bills for three months, a uh, fourth of the year. We, we not only paid January and February, we paid March as well. So that was a really big help to her. So we'll just pass the envelope around inside. There are individual envelopes, and if you uh, uh, if you want to put your name on it, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. It's strictly voluntary. Uh, you can put cash. You can put checks. Uh, you can just make out the check to Boston Avenue Church if you want to. Uh, Lillian is very good about being sure your money gets where you want it to go. And if it's in the big envelope or one of the smaller envelopes, you can be sure it'll get where you want it to go. Okay, the second thing in the way of announcements is that three weeks from today now, Dr. Walter Brueggemann will be here. I don't mean to teach this class, but he will be here for the lectureship. We've been trying to get Dr. Brueggemann for 20 years, probably. The committee and I have been trying. Uh, and, And he was always very gracious when we invited him. We didn't invite him every year for 20 years, but we started about 20 years ago, and every few years we'd try again. <clears throat> and, and he always was very kind, and, but he said, you know, to get to Tulsa from Georgia, uh, I, I would have to, you know, take up most of my Saturday and then to be with you Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I couldn't get back to Georgia because uh, uh, where he was, you'd have to fly to Atlanta and change planes and so on. Um, he said I'd miss all my Wednesday classes as well. So uh, I'd miss three days of teaching, and I just can't do that right now. So two years ago when I read in Christian Century magazine that Dr. Brueggemann was retiring, I called the committee and said, uh, how about if we invite him one more time? And they said, sure. So I wrote him a letter. I always say to these people we're inviting, this is what we can pay. This is what we need you to do, and so on. And uh, he answered me by email and said, I want to do this. I really want to do this. If I still have my mind in two years, he said, I want to do this. Well, he still has his mind, I can assure you. I opened my Christian Century magazine the other day, and uh, on the back side of the cover was a picture of him this big and uh, something that he's doing. And and, uh, when he sent us his flight schedule uh, for me to, uh, I mean, he didn't ask that I meet him, but I will. I'll be out there that Saturday night. But he's flying in from Portland, Oregon. He lives in Cincinnati because he's speaking in Portland on Friday and Saturday and then flying to Dallas and then up to Tulsa to be here with us. So this is an unusual talent. I told you that there are many good scholars who spend 40 years and then write a book on the book of the Bible he or she's dealt with. He has over 60 books. I have eight of them in my library. I was looking through the other day just to see just how many, you know. Well, 
there's one of his, there's one of his, there's one of his, and I had eight of them right there that I use uh, regularly when I deal with, with books that he does. Old Testament is his, is his thing. The Hebrew Scriptures are his specialty. So I have a big commentary wrote on Genesis, a big commentary on Exodus, uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, uh, Psalms, and a two-volume commentary on uh, Isaiah, first Isaiah, and then Deutero and Trito, Isaiah in the second volume. And then I have a book, which a collection of his prayers that actually his students, former students, got together at the time of his retirement and asked if, if they could have them and publish them. This is a professor who believes praying is so serious, he wrote a prayer for every day uh, before he began his class. And they're beautiful, profound, uh, basically, you know, for seminary students and where they are in their minds. So they're not always that maybe as helpful to you, uh, but certainly helpful <clears throat> to me and others. Okay. Does your wife tell you what to do? No. <clears throat> when we were dating and she said, you know, this can never be serious because I don't sing and I don't play the piano, I don't play an organ, I'd be scared to death if people uh, asked me to pray in public and so on. I said, what if I never asked you to do that? Well, what would you expect me to do? And I said, sit on the front row and root for me. I didn't say sit on the front row and tell me where to turn my chart. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Okay, here's a. N- it's not important. <laughs> what are you saying? What is this? They can't hear what you're saying. I no, said it's no, not no. important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on Tuesday, February 28th, um, we're having a luncheon. We've, we've done this with other speakers, of course, but uh, this time we think we'll have more. I mean, any clergy person who's been to one of our mainline seminaries, I mean Episcopalians and Lutherans and Presbyterians and United Methodists, who go to the mainline seminary, they all know who Walter Brueggemann is, I can assure you. So uh, I don't know how many of them will come. All I'm telling you is we're going to expand the possibilities. We're going to have that Tuesday luncheon in Community Hall. And uh, it's going to be $8 for a very nice lunch. And it's just question and answer. So we told him just four presentations, uh, same one twice on Sunday, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, four presentations, but question and answer with just staff people on Monday. That really helps them a lot to get to sit with the speaker and have that kind of interface. We've done that for years. And then Tuesday with you. So if you want to uh, have that special luncheon opportunity with him, you will need to make a reservation uh, about that. And you can call the church. Uh, At this point, you're being told as soon as anybody else is about the Tuesday luncheon, $8 in community hall. But I I can assure you, if you miss him, you're going to miss something very significant. Any questions about him that I might could answer? Yes. Of, Of his? If there was one book of his that I would recommend above the others, <clears throat> just because of the material, I would prob- my preference, I'd probably pick Genesis or Exodus. You know, just because I think those two books are so important. Uh, the heart of the Torah for us Gentiles is in the first two books. Um, numbers, you know, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, pretty important. Leviticus, Numbers, not much at all for us. Um, so I would recommend one of those two. Now, the Isaiah is terrific. Book of Psalms, well, they're all good. The cheapest one, le- least expensive, will be the Book of Psalms because it's in paperback. Um, I, and now as I think about it, I think both of the uh, two volumes on Isaiah are also in paperback. So that'll be a little bit less expensive. Um, scholastic books like this tend to be pretty expensive, you know, because they don't sell millions of copies. They sell mostly to seminary students and other professors. So, uh, But we are going to have Cokesbury here all three nights, and they will have his books. Uh, you know, they've agreed to do that, and we've asked them to bring his books here. So you, you might want to just leaf through them, you know, one night while you're having a cookie and punch and, and see which one you might like best. Okay? All right? Okay, I want to... 
visit, just for a moment at least, our Barton Clinton, I mean, our uh, Knippa lecturer from last Sunday night. I looked around, but I wasn't sure I saw any of you. Were any of you there to, to hear? You were, Dr. Swarber. Good. You had you, you, Diane. Virginia. I want you to get up and give us a synopsis of what she said last Sunday night. <laughs> okay. I think we need to revisit uh, her coming here. That was Dr. Amy Jill Levine. Dr. Amy Jill Levine. Uh, she is an unusual person in that she grew up in an Orthodox Jewish family in New Bedford, um, knew basically uh, Jews as she was growing up, but said, even though her family observed Sabbath every, every Friday night and they lit the candles and broke the bread and had the sip of wine, they lived in lobster country, so they had lobster on, on Sabbath night. And lobster is not kosher. You know, if it comes out of the sea, uh, observant Jews who do kosher don't eat anything that comes out of the sea unless it has gills and scales. Gills and scales. Uh, so the catfish in the Sea of Galilee are perfectly safe, and there are catfish there. Uh, you can see them, uh, particularly uh, right where the lake begins to be the river again, the Jordan River. And uh, it looks a lot like the Illinois to me. And I've stood there and seen catfish uh, swimming in the river. They don't eat catfish because they don't have scales. But they do eat the St. Peter's fish, it's called. Uh, she doesn't observe kosher. Now, I thought this was interesting. I told you that when the Jews uh, from the two southern tribes were taken off to Babylon, <clears throat> and they were so concerned, particularly their priests, that, that they might just become Babylonians the way the northern tribes had become Assyrians and ceased to exist as a separate people. The priest said, we've got to emphasize three things. If our people in Babylon will continue to circumcise the little boys on the eighth day of their lives, that's a significant thing for us. If we will eat kosher and not act like a Babylonian at the table, and if we will remember every Friday sundown until Saturday sundown to be observant Jews, we will not become Babylonians. By the way, were you watching the, any of the caucuses from uh, Nevada last night? Nevada? They call it Nevada, don't they? They had to keep polls open an hour after sundown for all observant Jews and Seventh-day Adventists. For Seventh-day Adventists and Jews, because they were not to be out voting until the sun went down and their Sabbath was over. All right. Dr. Amy Jill Levine says, in Nashville, where she lives, she and her family go not to a Reformed temple, not to a conservative synagogue. They go to an Orthodox synagogue but they don't eat kosher, which was strange. She said that she loves the ritual and the solemnity and everything of the Orthodox service. Uh, she finds it really meaningful and helpful to her and her family. But for her, she thinks kosher is not that important. and She eats what she wants to. So uh, that part was interesting. The second thing uh, that I pointed out to you before she came was that she chose to get her master's and her Ph.D. from Duke, which is a Methodist school, of course. It's not a Jewish school. It's a Methodist school. And then when she had these degrees, she applied for a teaching position at Vanderbilt Seminary, which is Christian, uh, and teaches New Testament studies as a Jew reads the New Testament. That's what she does. Okay, so she was here for the 25th presentation of the Knippa Lectures. And uh, her address was seven things Jews get wrong about Christians and seven things Christians get wrong about Jews. Okay. Now, I suspect that some of those things were new to some of you. They were not to me because I've been involved in the dialogue all these years. And we have talked about those 14 things any number of times when the Jews keep telling us, no, you, you're getting that wrong. And when we keep saying to them, no, you're getting that wrong. There were several things she said that I thought were very helpful 
and I, and I hoped you heard them. So if you weren't there or you didn't quite pick up on these points that I think were very significant, let me restate them for you. One, she reminded you that as far as we can tell, Jesus was the first person called rabbi. Did you hear her say that? All right. When Jesus lived, what were the leaders of the Jews called? Priests. Yes, Nan. They were called priests because they still had the sacrificial system in Jerusalem. Jesus' followers start calling him rabbi or rabboni, teacher. Teacher. It simply means teacher. Rabboni means good teacher. Good teacher. So she says, Jews get this wrong in not reading the Christian scriptures because here we have the first instance of one of our people being called a rabbi. After the destruction of the temple in 70 of that first century, the priests were out of a job. The Jews have never offered blood sacrifice since, ever. So their leaders became teachers and the synagogues became a place of teaching. All right, so that was significant. The other thing she said about that that I thought might have sort of flown past very quickly for you, the first writing that any community, Jew or Christian, has from a Pharisee, the writing of Paul. Paul said, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. She said, we don't have anybody before Paul writing from the Pharisaic position. And the reason that's so important is that all of America's Jews are descended from the Pharisaic movement. All of them. Rabbi Sherman, Rabbi Fitzerman, all of their congregants, they're all descendants from the Pharisaic movement. The others died away, and they continued. So she said, Jews need to read Christian scriptures, because here we have the instance of the first Jew being called a rabbi and the first Pharisee who wrote something that we have. And she said that the only problem is that we Christians are usually not understanding what Jesus and Paul had to say. We're not understanding much of what they had to say. And so she also pointed out that she and a, an esteemed professor at Brandeis University, which you know is Jewish, a, an esteemed professor at Brandeis, have now together gone through the whole Christian scriptures and put, it, put Jewish footnotes to every page. So it's the first time the New Testament has been annotated, annotated by Jews. Her, their book came out just a few weeks ago. It was available last Sunday night at the reception. So that's very significant. Uh, she agreed. I mean, she volunteered, actually. I'm on the committee for Knipp Electra, so I, I know she volunteered. Uh, that if there was a conservative group of preachers in Tulsa, and she suspected there is such a group, that she would be glad to talk with them about how they could go into the Easter season preaching the gospel without being anti-Semitic. So at first, we thought, well, maybe we could get Spoo to let him have that at First Baptist, maybe that. And then I said, I think there's a better place than that, or Roberts University. Or Roberts University. One of the professors there, Dr. Brad Young, is in our Jewish Christian Dialogue group. He got his Ph.D. at the university in Jerusalem, studying with one of the great esteemed rabbis of the last century, Rabbi David Flusser, Dr. Flusser. I mean, Brad Young teaches at Oral Roberts, and he is very concerned about dialogue. So we approached him. Furthermore, the new president at Oral Roberts University is a graduate of our Methodist seminary at Emory University Candler in, in Atlanta. So we have some real sympathy there as well. So they agreed to do it. And they set up for 200, and they had to put folding chairs in, folding chairs for all these preachers that came to hear. So that was terrific. Now, whether they'll do it or not, I don't know, but they got the mailing list of all the Southern Baptists in the area and all the inter, inter, uh, not inter non-denomination churches and invited all those preachers to come at no cost to them at all, come to Oral Roberts University, which they would consider safe ground for them. And she spoke to them. All right. Then at lunch Monday, before she had to fly back to Nashville, uh, at lunch she spoke to a group of us who are very active in dialogue. And, uh, and so she could, you know, say some different things and, and say them differently to us because we're on her side. We're, we're, we're trying to do some of the very same things that she's doing. 
I'm sure most of you know that Vanderbilt at one time was a Methodist university. It was a Methodist university. Why is it not now a Methodist university? The bishops dropped the ball. They literally dropped the ball. At the time of the Civil War, when the Methodist church split north and south, uh, the, the southern bishops, uh, it became known as the Methodist Episcopal Church South, on our cornerstone right at it here, it says we are a Methodist Episcopal Church South. Reunification did not come until 1939. This building was begun in 27. So that's what we were. The bishops were so involved in you know, trying to, to function now without all the northern half of the country. They didn't go to enough trustees meetings. And they let some wealthy, powerful people become trustees at Vanderbilt who one day voted, we don't want to be Methodists anymore. We want to run it ourselves. And they got a wealthy fellow named Commodore to give them a lot of money. And uh, the Methodist bishop sued them, and they went to court, and we lost. He said, nope, the way you let the bylaws be set up, they could elect the trustees. The trustees said they didn't want to be Methodists anymore, and so they're not. So you know what the Methodist bishops did? They said, well, then we'll build one better than Vanderbilt. And what they built was Emory in Atlanta. They built Emory University in Atlanta as their counterpart to Vanderbilt in Nashville. And, uh, you know, the money that built Emory? Coca-Cola. The Coca-Cola money built Emory. And uh, the Candler School of Theology is called Candler because the president of Coca-Cola was Mr. Candler. And he gave them millions of dollars, and uh, so did others. You know who built Duke? Duke Tobacco Company built Duke. Uh, so uh, these wealthy Methodists who made their money in different ways, uh, it was Duke Tobacco that first built Duke, and it was Coca-Cola money that built, Vander uh, be built Emory. But they were good Methodists. They were good Methodists, and they wanted to have a great university. So Emory was our answer to Vanderbilt. So Vanderbilt today has, is, is non-denominational. And she kept saying, particularly at noon on Monday, that uh, they tend to be more conservative than than Emory, more conservative than Duke, where she got her master's and, and doctorate degrees, and Perkins, and so on. So it's, so it's a little, it's more conservative. So that's even more amazing that uh, she's been there all these years. She told us openly that she's 55 years old now, uh, that she's been there all these years, and, and they still are making these students take her classes on how a Jew sees Jesus and Paul. So, okay. All right. Let me go to one other thing. Uh, specifically. In that group, uh, there are always some pretty conservative people, and that's good, you know, at the Canipa, that the conservative folks feel that they're really welcome there. And so when we have the question and answer period, often non-Christians get asked the question. And by the way, we tell the speaker every time, choose the questions you want. You don't have to answer questions you don't want to. There are always plenty. She chose to take it on, and that question was, all right, according to Jesus' words in John, he said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but, but by me. So what's going to happen to you when you get to the gate and Peter tells you you can't come in? I loved her answer, didn't you? She said, first of all, I've never thought of heaven as a gated community. I thought that was very interesting. I've never thought of heaven as a gated community. But if it is, she said, and I'm having trouble with Simon Peter, and she, she knew, I mean, she, at one point she was asked to comment on Islam, and she said, I don't comment on Islam because I don't comment on any religion whose book I cannot read in its original language. So what that means is, she not only knows the 39 scrolls of the Hebrew scriptures in Hebrew, she knows the 27 books of the Christian scriptures in Greek. And she's read them in Greek. And she says, because any time it's translated, you're getting an interpretation. Uh, you, you get an interpretation. You get the bias of the, of, the, of the translators. No matter how hard they're trying not to be biased, they are biased. And uh, so there's always, you know, little shadings from one translation to another. So she said, only if I've read them in the original languages. I'm telling you, for 30 years now or so, she's been reading the Christian scriptures and teaching them. So her next statement was, if I get there, and it is a gated community, and Simon Rocky, she said, the rock, is giving me trouble, I will look around for that other one. 
who 2,000 years ago would have been about five feet four and dark, with nail marks in the palms of his hands. I would ask for him. I'm willing to place it in his hands. I thought that was good. I thought that was really good. I've read your book, she said. I'm willing to place my eternity in his hands as I've come to know him. Okay. Still a Jew, understand. She's still a Jew. Who eats what she wants to and goes to the Orthodox uh, uh, synagogue in Nashville uh, with, her, with her husband. Okay, any, did any of you hear anything that she said or didn't say that we should come in on? <laughs> I was, uh, I, I felt a little embarrassed at one, at one point, not too much, a little bit, <clears throat> because uh, Dr. Ms. Hainer had told us they would save us a space down the front. We had him sitting on the front row last Sunday and introduced him. Uh, Dr. Hainer and, and Jane are two dear, dear friends, and we miss them very much since they moved to Texas in his retirement. But uh, anyway, we were sitting right down on the front row. <clears throat> and I have been involved in this dialogue for uh, more than 30 years. So what she was, and I've been to seminary too, of course, and so a lot of the little zingers that she was giving, I could tell other people weren't getting them, you know. But I was getting them. I, I knew what she was alluding to at every point. And uh, I, I was, you know, I thought it was, she was terrific. I thought she was, I told her, Monday at noon, you were terrific. Thank you for coming to Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're really grateful for your having been here. And uh, hope the preachers who heard her that morning at Oral Roberts uh, really heard what she was trying to say. Okay. Uh, let me say just a, a word. Some of you have written me uh, kind notes about... Uh, the honor that I'm receiving tomorrow night at SMU in Dallas. Um, I know that this uh, special honor, which came as an absolute and total surprise to me, I had no idea I was even being considered. And when the dean wrote to me and said, you're, you're it, you're our 2012 um, distinguished alum, I was really surprised. Uh, I know that I wouldn't even be considered if I'd not been at such a great church as this one for such a long time, that all of you have played such a vitally important part in whatever success uh, we've had together here for 32 years, and, and I know that tomorrow night I get to represent you uh, at that special moment and tell them how thrilled I've been to be your pastor all these years. Friday and Saturday just passed, I was in Oklahoma City. <coughs> to interview candidates for the Episcopacy. Uh, we have three openings in our jurisdiction coming in July, three retirements uh, that must be filled. And so there are right now nine candidates who've, uh, who've been endorsed by annual conferences, and we were interviewing them. And uh, <clears throat> so it was interesting to me, of course, that out of the nine, six of them are graduates of my seminary. Six of them were Perkins graduates, and so you know I knew them, and we spoke a common language. Uh, I, 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 I could read between the lines. I knew what they were saying, and, and all of them were kind about uh, tomorrow night. But yesterday morning, uh, Gary Mueller was was uh, being interviewed, and when he stood up and he saw me sitting right right in front of him, he said, "Oh my, Muzan Biggs is here." He said. You all know, don't you, that Monday night in Dallas, we're making him Pope. That's what he said. <laughs> so uh, anyway, they were very kind, and, and, and I, was, I was honored, and tomorrow night I will be honored uh, to, to, to tell folks how much you mean to me. Uh, one, the one thing that's going to be uh, special uh, to me is that uh, my mother and father dreamed that all three of their children would go to SMU. And I told you, they had never seen SMU. They knew it was big, and they knew it was Methodist, and that's all that was required. Uh, if it was big and Methodist, it had to be good. And so when we were very young, they started to, when you get to SMU, when you get to SMU. So when I was graduated, uh, my sister got her bachelor's degree the same afternoon that I got my master's. And our, our brother uh, was uh, a sophomore at that same time. And uh, tomorrow night will be the first time We've all three been on the campus at the same time since my graduation. 
I, you know, I, I started thinking about that. Gee, I mean, we see each other, but it's not in Dallas. We see each other, but not on, on the campus. And I've been, and I know my brother's been. I'm not even sure my sister's been back uh, in all these years. I, I'm not aware of any occasion when she's actually been back on the campus. Maybe she has. So I'm not aware of it. Anyway, they're supposed to be there. And so uh, uh, that will make it very special, you know, that, that we're all three. Uh, there and all three of us are SMU grads. That'll be very special. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to try not to talk about that. I'll try to talk about something else tomorrow night. Okay. Anything uh, else about the Canipa lecture? We are so uh, blessed to have uh, other kindred spirits in our community who want such a series. And uh, we're already looking forward to next year. We have a speaker, and some of you have been in past years when we had Dr. Martin Marty, uh, editor for many years of the Christian Century Magazine, while he was also teaching at uh, uh, University of Chicago Seminary. His son now, Peter, is going to come next year, and Peter is distinguishing himself as a really outstanding Lutheran pastor in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, writes occasionally in Christian Century Magazine. Dr. John Buchanan is now editor of the magazine. And uh, uh, Peter, Peter Marty, uh, writes from time to time. So uh, Grace is a Lutheran church, and so we, we thought it'd be great, again, to have a Lutheran. And Peter Marty will be with us next year on the last Sunday in January. So we'll be looking forward to that. Okay, anything else? All right, I thought we needed to talk about that a little bit. Let's open our Bibles then and we'll get underway. We're at uh, Acts chapter 13. If you're new with us, we thank you for coming. We hope you will like our class and want to come and be a part of us. We're making our way through the Bible again, but not every verse. You may think I'm putting you on about that because right here in Acts, I think there's so much that really needs to be dealt with uh, as Luke tries to help us understand. Obviously, he didn't know about you and me, but people of his generation understand how the Christian faith became a Gentile movement. How did it move from Judaism so that in just a little over a generation, all the Jews have gone back to the synagogue. The temple gets destroyed in 70. By the time Luke writes his gospel and the book of Acts, uh, it's, the temple's gone. Uh, it's gone. There are no more priests. Uh, there are rabbis, teachers, and they're building synagogues, uh, not only in what was uh, Judea, but they're building synagogues into Asia Minor uh, and, and moving all the way uh, over as the Roman Empire had already spread around the Mediterranean world. And the Jews, by the time Luke writes, have almost... 100% the next generation has gone back to, to their own people, if you would, to the synagogue, and it's become a Gentile movement, non-Jews. And, and what's expected of us as we relate to Judaism, as we see them as that root, that trunk of the tree into which Paul has already written long before Luke, and we haven't come to that yet this time through, but we will when we get to Romans, and he will talk about how we are the wild branch grafted into the trunk of Judaism. And Luke has much of that same feeling as does Paul. So I'm trying to help you see how we make that, that bridge and that transition. Let's pray. God, we, we are truly grateful for people like Dr. Amy Jill Levine who takes a lot of guff from certain Christians because she tries so hard to deal with them, to live among them, to help them understand as much as she thinks we need to know about the Jewish Jesus and the Jewish Paul. And we thank you for people in our own community like Pastor Knippa and Pastor Jim Hayner and now Rabbi Sherman who chairs our board and others who are really dedicated to trying to help us understand each other and to have respect for each other and to work together uh, for the common good in our community. Uh, we open your book and promise to give the best effort we have in Christ's name. Amen. We should say just a quick word that we have all lost another dear friend with the passing of Mr. Jack Zara. Uh, wow, what the Zara family has done for Tulsa as a uh, 
as the Schusterman family and, and, and the, you know, the Kaiser family. The, Mr. Kaiser last year, George Kaiser pumped into this community $150 million of his own money last year. Uh, Phil Lakin, who's a new, a new city councilor, uh, is also president of our Rotary Club, and I, I know Phil pretty well. Uh, he chairs the Community Foundation, and Mr. Kaiser uh, has put so much money into that foundation that Tulsa, Oklahoma, has the largest community foundation in America, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, so much of that money is being put into preschool education. Mr. Kaiser has a great concern, particularly for the minorities among us who who are not ready when they get to kindergarten and first grade, and they fall behind just immediately. And uh, so he's really putting his money into, into preschool Head Start programs and trying to find the best and most capable people he can to make that happen. Well, I, I can tell you that from my 32 years in this city and the work I've done with, with any number of groups in the downtown, I don't know where we'd be without these generous Jewish families. Uh, they have been terrific, just terrific. And uh, I saw Mr. Henry Zara and Jack uh, at Walt Helmrich's funeral here. Um, when I met with Peggy and their five sons about the funeral, um, she started, you know, trying to make a list of Walt's best friends. And the boys were unanimous and said, no, 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 wait, Mom. If you go there, you got to go here, and you got to go there, and you got to go. Let's concentrate on Dad's two best friends. We all know who they were. We all know who they were. And uh, she agreed, okay, you're right, you're right. And it was Henry Zara and Dr. Bob Perriman. They all agreed. They were, they were his two dearest friends. And so they were honorary Paul Barris uh, at, at the service. I know when Mr. Zara had his 90th birthday, it, it falls in the middle of the winter here, and the Helmricks were spending time in Florida. This was several years ago. Mr. Henry, I think, is 96 now, so about six years ago. And Walt and Peggy flew home to be here for Mr. Zara's 90th birthday. That's a significant. Uh, they, they believed he's been a dear friend all these years. So we all grieve uh, the death of Jack Zara. Uh, what a great community citizen he's been. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, all right, let's look at 13, chapter 13, verse 42. Luke is now turning more and more attention to Paul. He's told us the story of Paul's conversion, how he was one of the most outspoken uh, opponents of the early Christian church, how he was gathering up followers of Jesus and having them put in jail in Jerusalem, asked permission to go to the capital city of Syria, Damascus, and seek them out there and bring them bound back to Jerusalem to be put in jail. And on the road had this life-changing experience. Paul would never, ever be the same. Um, and he became, Luke is trying to show you how Paul became the voice of Christianity to the Gentiles, more than anybody else. The other disciples, the first twelve, were certainly significant. There's no doubt about that. They were really significant. But we have more writings of Paul and more about Paul in the Christian scriptures than anybody else except Jesus. Paul becomes that voice, and, and Luke sees that. Uh, by the time he writes, he knows Paul was the man God put in the right place at the right time. Okay, so verse 42 of verse, uh, chapter 13. So as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people urged them to speak about these things again the next Sabbath. Remember, they've been trying to tell people how, how Jesus is uh, the fulfillment of Hebrew Scriptures, that he is the long-awaited Messiah. When the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who spoke to them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Now, remember they're, they're at the synagogue. It's the Sabbath day. So everybody there basically is going to be a Jew. So here when Luke uses the Jews, he's doing the same thing John did in his gospel. He means the hierarchy, the officials, if you would, because not all the Jews are filled with jealousy and rage. Uh, the leaders blaspheming 
they, they are con- convinced that they're blaspheming to say that the one true God could be in a person. They contradicted what was spoken by Paul. That both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you. Okay. Luke is showing you how next it was spoken to everybody else, Gentiles. Remember the word for us in Hebrew is goyim, the goyim. And uh, in Greek, we're sometimes called, in, in Matthew's Gospel, I told you, the ethnics. We're called the ethnics, meaning everybody who's not a Jew. Since you reject it, this belief that Jesus was God's long-awaited Messiah, and judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life, but not accepting him is, is the argument, uh, we are now turning to the Gentiles. So already here, uh, Luke is pointing out that Paul and Barnabas are making up their minds. If we're going to get nothing but grief from all of you, then we're going to go to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, so that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when they say the ends of the earth, of course, they're still believing, as did everybody in their day, that the earth was flat. So as far north and south, as far east and west as we can go, we're going to proclaim the gospel. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. And they praised the word of the Lord, and as many as had been destined for eternal life became believers. Now, this is a difficult word for you and me, destined. So let's stop. We accuse the Presbyterians of believing in predestination. And here Luke gives you a hint here. As many as had been destined, I believe, we Methodists believe, that is saying, what Jesus often said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And some just couldn't hear it. Now, did God make it so that some didn't hear and some did? We Methodists say, absolutely not. We cannot imagine God choosing. There are so many passages in the Bible that says God is impartial not partial, doesn't choose to love some more than others. So this idea here that those who were destined to hear it heard it, I I think simply means that there are some who get it and some don't get it. Some hear it, some don't hear it. But we believe, officially, we Methodists believe, God doesn't stop anybody's ears from hearing. He wants everybody to hear. He wants everybody to accept. It is we who have somehow put ourselves in the position that we cannot hear, even when we hear the good news. Thus the word of the Lord spread throughout the region. But the Jews, and this means the leaders again, incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their region. So what did Jesus tell the disciples to do? Apostles, when he sent them out, this is what Luke says they did. So they shook the dust off their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The transcendent God who is as close as your own breathing. Okay, let's go back here because we're going to be talking about places, and I don't think it's so important for you to try to you know, remember where every city is that, that's going to be mentioned here. I don't think that's, thank you, that's so important. But you have a general feel for, for what we're talking about. Okay, so let's go back. This is all Mediterranean Sea. All right, you're willing to grant that. This is all Mediterranean Sea. Here we have what we know today as modern-day Israel. And here you have the Dead Sea I've drawn and the Sea of Galilee. And in Jesus' lifetime and immediately following, divided up into the northern province of Galilee, the middle province of Samaria, and the lower one of Judea, including, of course, the city of Jerusalem. Over here on the coast, Caesarea Maritima, the, the Caesarea of the Sea, uh, where Pontius Pilate had lived, uh, doesn't, uh, you know, continued to, to be governor after the death of Jesus. Okay, we know about a place called Antioch. So if you went up through modern day Lebanon's right here today, and then you get into modern day Syria, stretches like this. All right, up here, 
a place called Antioch, over here a place called Tarsus, where Saul was born. Okay, this today is Turkey. This, the Straits of Bosphorus. So here, Europe. Here, Asia. And since there's a much bigger Asia over there called China and India, this is called Asia Minor. Remember your geography? Asia Minor. So, I don't know just how far we'll get today, but in my reading uh, this week to get us get me prepared, uh, we're going to come soon to this passage where Paul had a vision, come over to Macedonia and help us. And Macedonia was in Europe. And Europe, you know, begins here and spills down into Greece. Didn't go as far as Italy here, but Greece. And this will be Athens and this will be Corinth. Okay, just to sort of reference you. Uh, so right now, all these places that are being mentioned are in modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And here I put Ephesus because if you've done any traveling in the Mediterranean, probably your cruise ship took you to Ephesus. Uh, uh, well, Ephesus, of course, are ruins now, but they take you to the nearest little port. And then you might have gone to the island nearby called Patmos, where Revelation was written. And, of course, there are hundreds, hundreds of Greek islands out in here. But for our use, these different places we're mentioning now are all here. Okay. Paul and Barnabas had taken a ship and had come down because it was quicker, and then they started visiting all these places. All right. So Iconium is another one of the places here. Uh, you can get a map. I have atlases in my office, but I don't have one big enough that those on the back row could see back there. Okay. The same thing occurred in Iconium, where Paul and Barnabas went first into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks, okay, Greeks, the Greeks, of course, controlled the Mediterranean world 400 years before, Paul and Barnabas are doing their work. Now the Romans control it. But the indigenous folk there are Greek speakers at this point. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Uh, it doesn't literally mean Paul and Barnabas were flesh and blood brothers, but they were brothers in Christ and they're doing this work together. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who testified to the word of his grace by granting signs and wonders to be done through them. But the residents of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, meaning the leadership, those hostile ones, and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, the apostles learned of it and fled on down the road to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued proclaiming the good news. Now, what Luke is simply trying to do is to say, every time they get mistreated, every time somebody's about to do them bodily harm, sometimes after they do them bodily harm, can't stop the gospel. It just spreads some more. So here, if you're trying to snuff them out, they just move on up the road, move on up the road, move on up the road, and every place they go, there are some who believe that this person, Mary's real child Jesus, a grown-up man who became a teacher and a preacher and a healer, whom they know was crucified in Jerusalem, whom now they've heard is not dead, but very much alive, and that the Holy Spirit is continuing his work among them. So everywhere they go, the word just keeps spreading, spreading, spreading. More and more believers. And we'll see in a few minutes that uh, in our reading that Paul says, let's go back now and check and see how everything's going. And they revisit all these places. But for right now, they just keep moving along one little place after another. Now when they came to Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet and had never walked for he had been crippled from birth. Uh, and what, what Luke is trying to point out here and what the other gospel writers point out often is this was a person blind from birth or deaf from birth or crippled from birth, meaning not something foolish that he or she had done to end up in this situation, but something terrible they didn't cause themselves. They didn't bring this upon them. 
They are innocent in that. They are suffering even though they're innocent of what's happened to them. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. And Paul, looking at him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, Now you see the conditions here. He's looking this guy straight in the eyes. He sees faith in this man. He believes Paul can do something significant for him. Paul suddenly says, Stand upright on your feet. And the man sprang up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language. And what they shouted was, The gods have come down to us in human form. See, Greeks believed in multiple gods, of course, meaning in Greek they were polytheistic. Multiple gods. They were polytheistic. And they have stories in their mythology about gods who came down and had intercourse with real female women and all sorts of things. They have all these crazy uh, myths to explain uh, things that they see around them. So they're just sort of putting Jesus into that group, you see, at first. They're not very informed here. The gods have come down to us in human form. So they started calling Barnabas Zeus, which you can imagine did not please him. Paul they called, and here you'll see if you're, if you're following along with me, it's a two-syllable word in Greek. The French took it over, and it now is the name of very expensive scarves that women have sometimes, you know, ties for men, erms, they usually call erms or something like that. But in Greek, it's Hermes. Okay, so Zeus and Paul, they call Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Now, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifice. If the gods have arrived, you've got to throw a rip-snorting big party here. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting. Now, think about it. Why the tearing of clothes? It was a visible sign in the Middle Eastern world of the first century. If you're undone by something, you tear your clothes. I've told you this before, but it, it was, I had not seen this. When we went to Greece on one of our trips, we were met at the airport. Uh, at Athens uh, by a young man whose hair was all disheveled, looked like he hadn't shaved in a couple of days. It wasn't really a beard, just looked like he hadn't shaved. Uh, shirt and pants looked like he'd slept in them. And he got us and helped us get our luggage and got us to the hotel and said, you know, the bus will be here in the morning at 8.30 or whatever after your breakfast. So we have breakfast, and the next morning we're all out there, and we get on the bus, and we have an older man, very nicely dressed, you know, hair combed, cleanly shaved, uh, coat and tie, and uh, he greeted us, and I just said, what happened to the guy yesterday? And he said, today he's burying his mother. I said, oh, no. He said, yes, yes. You didn't notice how he looked yesterday? I said, I noticed. And he said, well, once his mother died, didn't shave, didn't bathe, didn't comb his hair, didn't change his clothes, the community needed to see he was completely undone. He was undone by his mother's death. First time I'd seen that, you know. And so this older man spent the whole day with us. And the next day, the young man was there. He'd shaved and combed his hair and, you know, put on fresh, clean clothes. And he was ready to work again. Okay, his mother's death had undone him. So everybody in the Middle East would have understood when Paul and Barnabas come running out, tearing their clothes and saying, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? Well, that's, that, that's a big translation. That's a, okay, of what they said next. Okay. Now I've lost where I was. Where was I? Virginia? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I still haven't found it here. I still don't see it here. What if my Bible's not just like yours? <laughs> Top of 134. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was on the wrong column here. Good for you, Dan. Okay. Friends, why are you doing this? 
We are mortals, meaning humans, just like you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these worthless things, your gods and goddesses here, to the living Theos, Elohim, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to follow their own ways, yet he has not left himself without a witness in doing good, giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food and your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium and won over the crowds. Then they stoned Paul, rain rocks down on his head, and dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. This was really serious. But when the disciples surrounded him, he got up and went into the city, and the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. Okay, so you see that there are detractors who are following him. Now, when we get to Paul's letter to the Galatians, the church in Galatia, he will deal with this. And he calls this group who are following him around the Judaizers. The Judaizers. And what he means by that is the people who are following him who are saying these Gentiles can't come in unless they do circumcision, kosher, Sabbath. He can't just let these people in. And furthermore, Jesus wasn't the Messiah. He was really dead. That's what the Judaizers are doing. Now, it doesn't mean all the Jews. And Paul knows that the people in Galatia will understand the ones he's talking about. You and I sometimes forget who he's talking about. He's talking about these people that dogged his trail. Oh, gee, I've run out of time. Who've dogged his trail all this time and are following him and Barnabas and making life absolutely miserable for them. But every time they have more trouble, they just pick up and go, and the gospel keeps on spreading. Okay, February the 12th, I'm putting down chapter 14 and verse 21, right? 14 and 21. All right. Today we have children's choir. We have bells. We have the chancel choir. Don't rush off if you haven't been to church yet.